Okay. Okay. Yes. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining this webinar about protein aggregation as a therapeutic target in neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, we are going to have two sides debating the role of protein aggregation for neurodegeneration. Uh, one side defending this um, theory and um, another side revising uh, that theory. Um, well, this is a program and um, initially Professor Persuani from the Karolinska was supposed to be the moderator, the chairman, but uh, for health reasons, he's not able to attend. Um, so we have a distinguished uh, faculty of uh, four authorities in the field. We will discuss the views, your findings, and, um, and we are going to try to stick to the time. It's well, Friday afternoon here. Um, and after the first uh, lectures so of 15 minutes ish, we will have a rebuttal part, okay? And um, for this kind of debates, I know this can um, ignite passions and uh, uh, yes, strong uh, emotions. So we have some, some well, only one rule for actually, you know, for this uh, session besides uh, sticking to the time. And the rule is that anything but this kind of debate is allowed here, so. Do you want to share your... Uh... What do you say? You want to share your uh, screen? Oh yes, let me yeah. see. I will show you my screen. This, can you, let me see. Um, now I have my screen here. Can you see the screen now and the rules? Yeah, this is a program I mentioned. And now um, the only rule is that, yes, Stick, stick to time, but please don't, don't, don't have this kind of interaction. <laughs> so we, we have a, yes, um, a talk, a discussion, and, and we, you, you have the right to, to disagree as well. So anyway, now the first speaker is going to be Professor Jan Johansson from the Karolinska Institute. Professor Johansson is an expert. He's an MD and got a PhD. He's an expert on protein structures and mechanisms of action. He has developed um, a biologic drug for the treatment of respiratory distress, distress syndrome in premature infants and has discovered a chaperone with physiological, a physiological role uh, in preventing amyloid disease and is testing this drug against um, Alzheimer's disease. So, um, Professor, you have some welcome and, and go ahead, please. Thank you, Martin, for these kind words. So um, I'm obviously on the defending side, and I'll try in my 15 minutes to give you a um, short overview of what we have been doing on the protein aggregation and, and ways to defend it. So um, can you see my, my slide? Yep. yep. So this is what we are um, talking about. So um, if proteins behave nicely, they fold um, and um, that give rise to specific three-dimensional structures that then are able to uh, perform specific uh, functions. But if things go wrong, they might instead start to interact with uh, each other and form intermolecular contacts and end up in, in different types of, of clumps and these clumps can either be amorphous, which means that they basically lack a structure. And such clumps have been uh, associated with the cataract, for instance. But they can also form highly regular structures in the form of uh, amyloid. So amyloid is not uh, amorphous, it's highly structured. It's, it's as structured as the native conformation, but it has a completely different type of 3D uh, structure, which is non-functional and even worse, in my opinion, give rise to, to toxic effects to, um, to cells surrounding the amyloid and eventually disease. And um, the way to um, try to prove that this is actually the case um, can be many, of course, but I will focus on uh, two things, and that is, um, are there uh, mutations 
either in the aggregating proteins or in, the, for instance, chaperones. As you see in the uh, slide here, there are chaperones that can prevent uh, misfolding and can promote uh, correct folding. So if these mutations uh, give rise to aggregation in vitro, uh, will that uh, also be related to causing the disease in, in vivo? And the other way around, if this is true that aggregates give rise to disease, you would predict that if you manage to reduce the aggregation or even completely prevent it, that will be one way of treating or preventing the disease in, in question. And this is what we have been working on. And the reason we do that is that we, quite some years ago, started working on lung surfactant proteins. And I will not go into too much details because of lack of time, but uh, the bottom line is that lung surfactants keep your alveoli open by reducing the surface tension in, at the air-liquid interface. And there is one uh, specific protein called surfactant protein C or SPC that is important for um, uh, promoting the spreading of the phospholipids to, to the air interface. And if you're born prematurely, you can end up having respiratory distress syndrome because your surfactant system is not ready to, to cope with breathing air, and this is a, a lethal disease. But it can be treated with natural surfactant preparations that are extracted from um, pig or cow lungs. And a long time ago, we started a project uh, aiming to replace these natural surfactants with synthetic variants with the uh, obvious um, ambition to get out of having to use pigs or cows for, for making a, a drug for uh, premature infants. And for being able to do that, we first determined the structure of SPC to know what to mimic, and it's a transmembrane alpha helix. It's one of the most hydrophobic peptides that exist, but it's rather simple. It's only 35 residues, so you can synthesize it by peptide synthesis. So we thought that synthesizing this peptide, mixing it with phospholipids, and, and you will have a synthetic surfactant. And other groups try to do that as well, and we all failed, because instead of having a soluble, um, uh, nicely alpha helical peptide, we ended up with what you see in the electron micrograph there, which are typical amyloid-like fibrils. So in complete contrast to the native structure of SPC, which is experimentally determined, in alpha helix, we ended up with beta sheet aggregate. So it's, it is as far from the native structure as you can eventually uh, get. And these are completely non-functional and do not um, make a, a functional surfactant. So this was a, a dead end. And instead of um, giving up on the product, we started to look into the reason why this happens. And uh, again, there is a lot of information in this slide, but the bottom line is that you see, if you can see my, cursor here. Uh, well, so the alpha helical form of the peptide is so-called metastable, which means that it stays alpha helical as long as the helix doesn't open up. If the helix does open up, it will not refold to the helical structure again, but it will end up in, in beta sheet aggregates. The reason being that the SPC has a very peculiar amino acid sequence. It's made up of a stretch of, of valence and valence is actually the most uh, overrepresented residue in beta sheet uh, structures. So nature has, for some reason, chosen the, the least suitable sequence to make the SPC helix. And uh, then in retrospect, when we started with the synthetic peptides, we started with the non-helical conformation, and of course we ended up in the beta sheet aggregates, as you saw in the electron micrograph, instead of uh, uh, ending up in the alpha helical functional form. And nature has solved this problem in forming the uh, metastable uh, SPC alpha helix by introducing a Brickos domain in the precursor of, of SPC, which is about uh, uh, four or five, uh, five times bigger than the SPC, so it's 200 residues. So now we'll come back to this Brickos domain. But in the presence of Brickos, this forms and then it's cleaved out and then it's metastable. So if it opens up, it goes into the beta sheet aggregate. And as Martin, um, mentioned in the introduction, we solved this problem by simply replacing all the valence, which are then the, the drivers of the beta sheet aggregation with leucines, which are equally hydrophobic, but are no longer uh, prone to form beta sheets, but they instead for, are prone to form alpha helices because the side chain of leucine is branched 
one carbon atom further away from the from the polypeptide backbone. So this so-called uh, uh, polylu replacement of SPC or SPC uh, lu nicely forms a helix. It does not aggregate, doesn't form fibrils, and it stays in, in soluble state for for weeks. While the SPC, as I said, once it starts to uh, open up, it will go out of solution and just aggregate. And this SPC leucine is the basis for this synthetic surfactant, which now is in clinical trials. Um, the company that we collaborate with ha has um, finished a phase two clinical trial in the US, treating 120 some uh, premature infants. It is as efficient as the surfactants that are derived from, from, for instance, pig lungs. So hopefully this will in the future end up as a fully uh, re functional replacement of the animal derived uh, surfactant preparations. So getting back to the theme of this um, uh, webinar, uh, we then uh, started thinking about why is it and how is it possible that this very uh, beta prone sequence of the polyvalent stretch actually forms this um, uh, helix, which it shouldn't form according to predictions. And then in particular, uh, this was um, promoted by the finding by Larry Nogi and others in, at Johns Hopkins that there are a number of mutations in the pro-SPC sequence, which all are associated with severe lung fibrosis and often occurring in very early age. So this uh, happens to uh, young children, and this is a lethal disease. So this is a specimen from autopsy. And then we thought maybe the reason that these uh, um, children get sick is that uh, they actually accumulate aggregates of this uh, nasty polyvalent SPC peptide. And we stain it with Congo red, and you see that it forms typical green, red, birefringent uh, uh, deposits. And also we could stain these uh, deposits with an antibody against SPC, and they stain uh, nicely. You see the brown uh, color, and you see the uh, green uh, birefringents in the, in the periphery. So these aggregates are made up of SPC, the polyvalent part, and this then um, uh, su supports the idea that this BRICOS domain is needed in order to form the uh, alpha helical SPC. If the BRICOS domain is inactivated by mutations, this doesn't work. And um, this is an amyloid disease. This is the definition of amyloid, and it's the only amyloid disease that, uh, as far as I know, that occurs early in, in life. So as I said, these are our children while most other amyloid diseases uh, occur uh, quite late in, in life. So this, I think, supports the concept that this is an extremely amyloidogenic peptide sequence with a polyvalent uh, transmembrane uh, segment. And then, then nature has um, put the BRICOS domain in there to, to enable uh, folding into the correct structure. If this is mutated, we, we get amyloid disease. So I think this supports the concept that aggregation of an amyloidogenic region will cause disease if it's not um, prevented by, by different means. And uh, these mutations do not occur in healthy individuals. So these are not polymorphisms. So you, if you have these mutations, you will, uh, as far as we know, end up with uh, lung fibrosis and uh, amyloid uh, disease. And we have used cell models to express the pro-SPC uh, with and without the mutations. Uh, with the mutations, we get Congo-positive deposits, but if we keep the mutations and then replace the polyvalent sequence with the, with the polyleucine sequence, as in the synthetic surfactant peptide, we no longer get the congo red positive de deposits, even in the presence of the mutations. So this, I think, strongly supports the concept that this is the troublemaker, and it will form amyloid unless there is a functional BRICOS. But even in the presence of a dysfunctional BRICOS, if there is a polyleucine that spontaneously forms a helix without a uh, chaperone, the, there will be no protein aggregation and uh, no uh, disease if you um, extrapolate it to the in vivo situation. So uh, the um, hypothesis from this is that nature has in some cases used very amyloidogenic sequences. I think the most extreme one is the polyvalent sequence of pro-SPC, but there are other examples. There is the BRI2 protein, which also contains a BRICOS domain and uh, is expressed in the CNS. And if there are mutations in BRI2 instead, you will end up with the longer um, 
peptide called ABRI or ADAN because it's associated with familial British or Danish dementia. And uh, this is also an amyloid disease which gives rise to, as I said, dementia. It's quite similar to Alzheimer's disease, by the way. And we then hypothesized that in this case, the Brekos domain is there to, uh, in under physiological conditions, promote the correct folding of this uh, part of the Bre2 protein, which is also has a high beta sheet uh, propensity like the transmembrane region of, of pro-SPC. And this is the crystal structure of the pro-SPC Brekos the domain, it's an around 100 amino acid residue, so it's a rather small protein with a unique uh, fold. But from this, we started thinking that if the Brekos domain has these fantastic properties of being able to prevent amyloid formation, why don't we try to apply that to a more severe problem when it comes to, to human health and human health economics, and that's Alzheimer's disease. It's an increasing um, uh, number of people being affected by Alzheimer's because the major risk factor is age and with an increasing average age of the population we will have more Alzheimer's patients and um, this is I guess part of the controversy that we're going to discuss but it, it it's called Alzheimer disease because uh, Alois Alzheimer found that in um, particular patients there are these plaques of the A beta peptide and there are intracellular tangles of the of the tau protein and this has uh, been then thought to cause the disease, which has obviously been, been questioned. This is why we are gathered today, and we'll come back to that. But our attempt was then to see, can we use the recombinant uh, Brickos domain, then either from the pro-SPC or from the Bre2 protein, and see if that affects the A-beta aggregation and amyloid formation, and in the long term also neurotoxicity. And the answer is yes, so we can. So this is an um, thioflavin T uh, um, traces of the A beta 40 peptide. It will look the same with the 42, the more amyloidogenic, but it's uh, aggregating quicker. So without any additives, it forms fibrils that are detected by thioflavin T. But in the presence of small amounts of either the pro-SPC, and this is only the Brekos domain, the rest of the precursor proteins uh, have not been produced we can either delay or completely prevent the formation of amyloid fibrils. And this is of course um, interesting that there is no sequence specificity, but the Brekos domain can prevent amyloid formation of a completely uh, different peptide than the ones that they, they are supposedly has evolved to, to prevent aggregation of. But more importantly than that it just reduces the aggregation, it also reduces the effects on, on the neurons. So this is an um, uh, electrophysiological recording from a hippocampal slice of a brain, a mouse brain, and you see that there are um, abundant uh, oscillations, and particularly in the frequency range between 30 and 80, the so-called gamma range. If we put rather low concentrations of A-beta-42 on there, these uh, gamma oscillations will be severely reduced. But if we do this in the presence of Brickos, they are back to, to normal again. So it's not only that it inhibits, it delays the aggregation, it also delays the important parameter, namely the uh, toxic effects on, on the neuron, uh, neurons, in this case, as measured by, by the gamma oscillations. And the mechanism, which I think I'll come back to a bit, little bit later, is that the Brickos domain sits it binds to the surface of fibrils and thereby it reduces the so-called secondary nucleation step in the A-beta fibril formation. And that is the step where the surface of the fibrils work as a, as a catalytic surface, bringing monomeric A-beta uh, down there so that the monomeric A-beta can form uh, these oligomers in a, in a much more rapid manner, and this is what determines the, uh, the sigmoidal shape of the uh, aggregation traces. And it's also the main source or the generator of the toxic oligomers. This has been shown quite nicely by Sara Linsa and Thomas Knowles and their collaborators in a number of publications. And they have also shown that the Brickos domain is a very efficient inhibitor of this uh, generation of the, of the oligomers. We tested this further in uh, transgenic uh, mice to start with. These are mice that uh, overexpress uh, mutant presinolin, which makes them form more of the A-beta-42 peptide. They get all aspects of uh, amyloid um, pathology. They get plaques, they get um, uh, memory deficits, and they get neuroinflammation. 
And all these uh, aspects can then be prevented if we uh, inject using a virus vector uh, coding for either pro-SBC or the brick to BRICOS domain, only the BRICOS again can uh, restore memory function in the Morris water maze, reduce the plaque formation, and also um, quite um, dramatically reduce the neuroinflammation, in this case, as measured by the GFAP uh, levels in the, uh, by Western blots and by immunohistochemistry. So then this is, uh, I think, promising from a therapeutic point of view, but it's still uh, not really translatable to, to humans since it was, then, as I said, being expressed from, from day one uh, in, in the uh, mouse um, uh, pups. And, but um, uh, the, Bricos, the recombinant BRICOS also passes the blood-brain barrier. So this is the breed 2 BRICOS injected in the tail vein of, of mice, wild-type mice. And then we can detect it in the brain by immunohistochemistry, see the red color, but also by immunoprecipitation and also measuring the amounts by, by ELISA and a, a reasonable amount of uh, BRICOS actually passes. So there are several hundreds of nanomolar of, of BRICOS after two hours in, in the brain homogenates and up to 1% of the total amount injected uh, passes the blood brain barrier, which is um, surprising because it's a protein, it's a small protein, but it's still a protein. They should not uh, pass uh, the blood brain barrier like um, antibodies, for instance, uh, which are bigger, but they don't, it's, uh, in practice do not pass the blood brain barrier at, at all. So this made us confident enough to uh, make an experiment in another uh, Alzheimer mouse model and then injecting recombinant BRICOS intravenously and uh, even at the late age and old age of the mice. So these are also called uh, APP knock-in mice. So instead of overproducing the precursor, they produce it at normal levels, but then there are mutations to, to make them uh, produce more of the A-beta uh, 42 in particular peptide. And they also get uh, all aspects of Alzheimer pathology, and this is unpublished work. And by treating these uh, mice, uh, they were 19 months at start for, for two months, giving them in, in, intravenous injections twice a week. We could, to our satisfaction, I must say, see effects on all aspects of so the behavior is uh, improved, they get more physically active, they get less anxious, they enter the uh, center of the open field um, much more often than the PBS treated controls, they get less of uh, a beta plaques, they get less of uh, GFAP staining in particular in the surrounding of the plaques it appears, and they get less of uh, EBA1 staining, the marker for, for microglia activation. And this can be quantified, so there are statistically significant effects on all these aspects after only two months treatment with intravenous injections in mice that already have established pathology, which I think is um, uh, very promising actually. And at the end here, I'll just come back to then the um, uh, initial question I raised, that is um, if protein aggregation cause disease, then one would predict that um, factors that prevent or reduce aggregation in vitro should be able to then reduce the uh, pathological effects uh, also in vivo. And I don't have time to go into too much of details, but as you see here, these are the results from in vitro experiments, either on the oligomer formation, just biochemical experiments, or the gamma oscillations in mouse hippocampal slices. So using the ratio of um, BRICOS to A beta that you would predict in the brains of these mice after knowing the how much is transferred and after measuring the A beta 42 levels in the mouse brains. And you see that it surprisingly well uh, fits with the reduction that we see of the BRICOS treatment. So this is the effect of these parameters, for instance, the, the plaque count, the plaque load, the GFAP, the EBA in the treated uh, mice compared to the levels that we see in the PBS treated controls. So, uh, so I, I think this is a very strong argument for the possibility that the reduction we see in the formation of uh, A-beta oligomers, and in particular in the neurotoxicity, as measured in the hippocampal slices, very well predict uh, the effect in the in vivo situation after uh, uh, intravenous treatment with the, with the BRICOS domain. So, so this are the, I think, um, in my view, um, strong arguments 
for the possibility that um, the aggregation is uh, the fa factor uh, causing driving the disease and it can be prevented then by means that prevent the aggregation um, that have been optimized in vitro and they can be translated to the in vivo situation and I hope I'll be able to come back and, and discuss this further in the in the discussion part and I'll just by, end by uh, stating the obvious that I haven't done this myself number of people involved during during the years to recurse that in the surfactant work Shafi Manchanda did most of the work in the uh, intravenous treatment of, of the mice Per Nilsson has co-developed this APP knock-in mice when he was a postdoc and uh, at Riken. Now he's at Karolinska and we are collaborating. And Gefei, Axel, uh, and Lorena and Simona have been all taking part in, in the in vitro work as well as in the, in the animal studies. Andrea Fison has uh, done all the gamma oscillation studies and Sara Linse we collaborated with in the early studies on the effects of the BRECOS on the secondary nucleation. Per Westmark is a pathologist in Uppsala. He did the staining of the lung fibrosis tissue, seeing that there are amyloid deposits of, of SPC in, in the um, uh, children with mutant pro-SPC. So um, thank you for, for your attention and looking forward to the discussion. Martin, you are mute. Martin, you are mute. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, um, Janne. Uh, now uh, is uh, Professor Alberto Spies uh, turn. Uh, he, well, Alberto is a professor of neurology and he's a chair of the University of Cincinnati, James and John Garner Family Center for Parkinson Disease and Movement Disorders. He's, um, well, a leading authority in the field of movement disorders. He's uh, also in charge of the task force for technology of the International Parkinson Disease and Movement Disorders Society, and he's also uh, secretary of the Pan American, Pan -American section of the M MDS. Um, so uh, Alberto, please um, go ahead with your talk. Thank you, Martin. Thank you very much uh, for the organization and I'm delighted to be part of the uh, discussion. I will stick to 15 minutes uh, as opposed to 25. <laughs> so hopefully we will uh, make the best cases. Feel free to interrupt me if for some reason I'm on minute 16. So first, uh, I want to emphasize that the nosology for neurodegenerative diseases is based on the accumulation of a specific proteins. And in Parkinson's, that is alpha-synuclein. Yet the studies have shown that, in fact, it is mixed pathologies, what is the rule in Parkinson's disease, that not only do you accumulate individuals with Parkinson's, that is alpha-synuclein, but a variety of other uh, pathologies, including the pathology of Alzheimer's. Uh, in uh, over 50% of individuals, as you see here, with a median of three pathologies, and with the weighting of pathology scoring not affecting progression in those with versus without clinical Parkinson's, which is interesting. The same is the case for Alzheimer's, in which the hypocampal volume does not relate to the Alzheimer's pathology, and in fact, only 3.2% of the variance in the hippocampal volume is attributable to pure Alzheimer's pathology. This is uh, what uh, allows us to begin to question uh, really seriously the axis on which the definition of these diseases are based on. This is a very large study and essentially shows that the pathology that we would consider defining of Parkinson's is in fact equally prevalent in subjects with versus without Parkinsonism. And damningly, uh, among those who have Parkinsonism, uh, a full third of them would have no Parkinson's pathology. Uh, this is uh, a serious challenge to the nosological aspect whereby pathology equals pathogenesis. 
if we move into uh, the possibility of understanding whether a Parkinson's gene, in this case, LARC2, which uh, we assume as uh, to date the most common autosomal dominant form of Parkinson's, uh, in fact, giving rise to a variety of different diseases if we judge them on the basis of the types of pathology that accumulate, including tau, TDP43 uh, uh, accumulation, as well as the possibility of no protein accumulation whatsoever, uh, suggesting that the aggregation of alpha-synuclein is not necessary for Parkinsonism to occur. The models in which alpha-synuclein is given directly, of course, uh, are uh, difficult uh, to make sense of because that doesn't happen in the wild. Uh, in animal models do not actually aggregate alpha-synuclein to the extent humans do. But the GBA model is an interesting one because in this situation, in a uh, time-dependent fashion, there is an increased accumulation in the homozygous mice of glycosyl sphingosine which interestingly, in fact, gives to a corresponding time-dependent rise on the uh, aggregated alpha-synuclein. And so this allows us then to ask the question, what would happen in this fashion related to the cells? And in fact, the problem is that this doesn't give rise to inflammation or cell death, uh, but this is data that you have to get the authors to get back to you on because since they didn't find that it was causing any problems, then this is not something that makes it into the publication. The hippocampal accumulation of aggregates, in fact, was not sufficient to cause the behavior, and in fact, it was required the loss of glucose cerebrosidase activity for it to develop, suggesting that alpha-synuclein aggregation is not sufficient for Parkinsonism or for neurodegeneration to occur. If any of us were to die much sooner than we would have uh, been hoped for. Uh, the question uh, that would emerge if a pathology uh, of any type were to be found is that we were in our ways to developing that condition. So if that would have been the case with Alzheimer's pathology, we would have said that's where we were heading into. The trouble with that is that centenarians have offered us an opportunity to look at this issue in we no longer have the excuse that they are not, not old enough. So half of those over 90 have pathology of Alzheimer's without dementia. And interestingly, cognition is not correlated with pathology. And in some studies, in fact, normal cognition is associated with increased pathology, which is paradoxical. Apolipoprotein epsilon 2 allele, which we know has been associated with a reduced risk of dementia, is in fact, uh, found to be associated with an increase in Alzheimer's pathology, which is paradoxical. According to our model, we would not expect that a, a table like this would include in the first row, ID pathology alone, an equal mix of patients in the dementia and not dementia category, which is consistent with the prior slide that there is a 50% chance of having dementia without uh, this condition or the vice versa, uh, having no dementia and yet having pathology. This data allows us to calculate the odds ratio of dementia with pathology, and that is 3.5, which is consistent with the worldview that there is a three to four fold risk of dementia given pathology. But this very data also allows us to ask what's the odds ratio of dementia with non-AD pathology. That means everything that's listed at the bottom, anything that isn't part of what we defined as Alzheimer's pathology. And that is 12.4, which is paradoxical because when you then do the calculation of the odds ratio of dementia, uh, given AD pathology compared to non-pathology, that is 0.3 with a confidence interval that spans still in the protective range. This is the model that uh, we have come to learn about dementia. Everything goes up, uh, beginning with, as you see here, a, a curve uh, that shows CSF a beta 42, then amyloid PET, then CSF tau goes up, then MRI changes, first uh, functional changes, then structural changes, and eventually, of course, the clinical picture. So that's what we know as the model. Everything going up 
But in fact, uh, the problem is that the data is from where the model is generated shows that the CSFA beta 42 doesn't go up. In fact, it goes down and it tracks with uh, the atrophy in the hippocampus. The Alzheimer's continuum is that the concept whereby anyone who has Alzheimer's pathology, and in this case, amyloid only, uh, as measured by PET uh, or by CSF, so PET increase or CSF would be in that uh, category. And this is the largest data so far generated of individuals that are positive. And I want to draw your attention to two curves. The first in green is the Alzheimer's continuum. This is the amyloid uh, curve. Uh, that goes linearly from about 18% at about 60 years to uh, over 70% at the age of 90 for those lucky enough to live that long. But in red is, in fact, the curve of dementia. And what I want to point out here is that these curves, in fact, diverge for the largest bulk of the first 20 years. And it, the curves do not become uh, parallel until the age of 85. If amyloid were to be the toxic species we assume it to be, we would expect the curve to approach uh, that of amyloid positivity within a normal lifespan, such that by the age of 85, a, rate, a ratio of uh, amyloid to dementia of one would be expected. Instead, by the age of 85, we have a five-fold redu reduced prevalence of dementia among those who are amyloid positive. So in other words, suggesting that uh, that state uh, would still predict more often no dementia than dementia. In those who have autosomal dominant mutations in Alzheimer's disease generating uh, uh, conditions, uh, mutations, in fact, it is interesting that we have now evidence to show that it is the soluble species that declined as early as 25 years before symptom onset. So that is a very early change. It's not so much the aggregation as much as the loss of the precursor of the aggregates, the soluble uh, fraction of a beta 42, which will be explained at a later lecture, is in fact the functioning species of amyloid. We conducted an ADNI analysis very recently. Uh, ADNI is the largest uh, cohort of individuals uh, with, who are uh, at risk of dementia already may have uh, amyloid positivity. And what we did is we, in fact, took in only the patients who or were already in the amyloid, in the Alzheimer's continuum. So they were amyloid positive. That was uh, by a SUVR, the standard uptake value ratio greater than 108, which is the standard uh, uh, threshold above which we are considered amyloid positive. Well, that study showed that in fact, uh, it was the CSF a beta 42 above the threshold of 800, which predicted normal cognition in those who are already amyloid positive, uh, with a very linear association between each standard deviation increase in CSF a beta 42 levels and hippocampal volume. But this is what's most interesting about this analysis that when we looked at the burden of amyloid, and this is in the x-axis by SUVR, the amyloid burden uh, captured by PET, first thertile, second, and last thertile, so the, the highest thertile, of course, the greatest, the amyloid burden in the brain. And in the y-axis is the CSF A beta 42, that's cut off here, but that's essentially the levels of, uh, of soluble A beta 42. What you see at each tertile is that the levels of uh, CSF A beta 42 are higher in cognitive, no, cognitively normal individuals compared to Alzheimer's and even MCI. The same in the second and third tertiles. The only loss of significance is in the, in the highest level of burden in terms of the comparison between cognitively normals and MCI, uh, presumably because uh, it is a stage in which there is a lot more of the soluble fraction invested into the aggregators and therefore less of it uh, to kind of distinguish these two groups. But certainly the distinction remains very clear between cognitively normal and Alzheimer's. So the conclusions from this analysis on the ADNI data set are that given any amyloid burden level, high levels of soluble A beta 42 peptide are correlated with normal cognitive function and hypocampal volume. So that would explain the toxicity, assumed to be so, of higher levels of amyloids without dementia. 
Therefore, the loss of soluble A beta 42 is the more likely explanation of toxicity. We did a very similar analysis with PPMI. Unfortunately, alpha synuclein cannot be measured in the brain, but we looked at whether or not the protein levels in CSF could be predicted to associate with changes in brain volume. And the sure answer is that, in fact, there is no association. This is a four-year data. Uh, so the answer really here is negative for the proteins to be directly neurotoxic themselves. So this is the time to abandon the toxic proteinopathy concept that drives neurodegeneration. Uh, Parkinson's disease causes alpha-synuclein aggregation, not the other way around. Insoluble protein accumulation is of uncertain toxicity. What is certain is that the loss of soluble protein, which is the functioning fraction, is toxic. Alpha-synuclein aggregation is neither necessary nor sufficient for the development of Parkinsonism. And in fact, is neither necessary nor sufficient for the development of brain atrophy. Finally, Parkinson's disease is a problem of alpha-synuclein deficiency, as well as Alzheimer's, a problem of A-beta deficiency. Therefore, the change is very important because the targets of our uh, ongoing uh, studies for Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative diseases is in fact targeting the aggregates as opposed to replacing that which is deficient. And with that, thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, great job, Alberto. Thank uh, you. Thank you very much for this, for sticking to the time as well. Um, and um, now we move on to Next speaker, and that is uh, Professor Simon Mead, um, an expert on prion diseases. Um, Professor Simon Mead obtained his PhD degree uh, on the, in the genetics of prion diseases at Imperial College in London, and he's also a consultant neurologist and a clinical lead of the UK National Prion Clinic based at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery, Queen Square. He's also working at the UK Medical Research Council's Prion Unit. And um, his main area of research interests are clinical trials um, enrolling patients affected by crucial jacko disease and other uh, prion diseases, as well as to discover gene modifiers for prion diseases and to develop treatment for these lethal conditions. So um, yes, please, uh, Professor Mead, go ahead with your talk. Thanks, Martin, very much for the introduction. I hope my slides are coming through OK. OK, so, I, you know, Alberto, that was a great presentation, but I don't agree with your conclusions. And, and you know, to, to try and persuade you, naturally, I want to turn to prion diseases as a model, as a model disease in neurodegeneration. And I want to do that, I want to do that largely by reviewing history. History of prion diseases, how did we come to learn about the prion as an infectious agent? And then to what extent is the prion model a suitable model for neurodegeneration? And then uh, to finish, I, I want to specifically address the debate subject, which is what is the right target in neurodegenerative diseases? And actually the conclusion I come to based on my work and, and my knowledge of the prion field is exactly the opposite of Alberto. So we have a nice, we have a nice conflict to debate. Okay, so first of all, history, prions and prion diseases for five minutes. Okay, so um, anyone my age We're will remember. Simon, do you have the slides, sir, not up? Huh? Sorry, I didn't catch that. Your, your slides are not shared. Are they not moving? They're, they're not actually seen. You're not sharing yet your screen. Oh, okay. I thought I had. Bear with me a second. How's that? Am I sharing now? Yeah, that now it's great. Yeah, good stuff. Thank you. Thanks for interrupting me rather than like 10 minutes in. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to go to full screen. So let me know if it does it go full screen now? No, no yes. it does. Yep. Yeah, good. Okay. So I've got some videos here. I don't know if they're playing. Um, these are videos of, of cattle uh, with bovine spongiform encephalopathy, which um, Anyone my age, I shouldn't need to remind, but for those younger, 
was a devastating epidemic of cattle prion disease that hit the UK and sadly we managed to export it around Europe to, and other countries um, in the late 1980s, early 1990s, and it completely and utterly devastated the, um, the British domestic herd, um, probably affecting estimates are up to something like six or seven million cattle over that period of time. And this was because of an infectious agent, a proteinaceous infectious agent, a toxic proteinopathy that was spread through the cannibalistic recycling of cattle carcasses back into cattle feed. Okay, this is a real disease that had huge uh, economic um, consequences and was probably, until this year, <laughs> was probably the major public health disaster of my lifetime. Uh, tragically, it caused variants CJD. Uh, in the field, this is not really contested now. It's the same prion strain. We didn't think it was going to spread, or many people didn't in the early 1990s. It did, and to date it's killed about 230 predominantly uh, young people um, uh, of, of uh, variant CJD, and subsequently spread human to human through blood transfusion. Um, and uh, there's been three cases of people that received blood donated by those incubating or in the very early stages of variant CJD disease. It, it's also an active problem now. Um, a, 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 an endemic um, prion disease of cervid species is prevalent in North America. Um, it's been detected in Scandinavia. And the Norwegians made huge efforts to try and eradicate it in the Nordfjella region, but don't seem to have been successful. This is not a zoonotic, as far as we know, um, but is a contagious disease in the wild of cervid species. The first human um, transmissible, uh, what is now known to be a prion disease, was Kuru, that many of you will know, this notorious disease of the foray-speaking people of Papua New Guinea, who we now know transmitted this disorder through cannibalism. And the disease was eradicated in this population after the Australian administration banned cannibalism in uh, the 1950s. Cannibalism, uh, sorry, um, Kuru subsequently died out in this population uh, and nobody born after 1960 who didn't participate in the ritualistic mortuary feasts that spread the disease has died from the disorder. There's been some tragic medical mistakes that have led to the medical spread of CJD in humans, including the use of duramata associated material in neurosurgery, the use of cadaver-derived human growth hormone and pituitary treatments, and following some neurosurgical procedures that have killed several hundred individuals, and people are still dying following the use of prion-contaminated pituitary hormones in the 1970s. Prions um, show fascinating strain phenomena. So we can see quite different clinico-pathological phenotypes, scan appearances, clinical signs, molecular phenotypes, based on different prion strains um, that can be uh, persistent in their transmission through animal species and are encoded um, in a way that's not completely understood, but are probably encoded in three-dimensional structure. How do we know that um, prion particles, proteinaceous particles, are the infectious agents of these disorders that cause epidemics? Well, this is very long-term um, conclusion um, that is totally accepted by the prion field and others. Two Nobel Prizes have been awarded for this work, starting with Colton Gadisek's discovery that Kuru was a transmissible disorder to chimpanzee, published in 1966, and then the major step forward by Stanley Prusner showing that the infectious agent of hamsters um, was a proteinaceous um, element or co-purified with a protein of molecular weight 27 to 30 kilodaltons. Um, he coined the term prion and he also won the Nobel Prize in 1997. People still debated the concept. Um, but it was nailed really by two pieces of work completely. One is Charles Weissman's 
um, knockout of the prion protein gene. So the, pro uh, the gene that encodes prion protein was knocked out. These mice could not get prion disease despite being injected with thousands of lethal pathogen doses. Um, that didn't quite convince everybody until Claudio Soto showed at about the turn of the millennium that by a process of incubation and sonication, he could amplify, well, near femtograms amount of protein in its abnormal form uh, into massive amounts of infectious units using the protein misfolding cyclic amplification technique, um, which has been adapted by Byron Coe and, um, and altered uh, to make it more practical using recombinant material um, as a fantastic diagnostic assay for CJD, the RT quick test, which similarly can amplify uh, billions of fold over. So what do all, all this work, uh, what conclusion does it all come to? That, that the pathogen is comprised, um, th this is the normal form of the prion protein, and the pathogen here is comprised of a multimeric assembly that can be seen under electron microscopy of purified prions. It is a, a beta sheet predominant, so an alternative uh, secondary structure. It's stabilized through intermolecular bonding. We're not exactly sure of its, uh, of its structure, but the, the mechanism is through, the mechanism of prion propagation is through binding the normal form, templating the abnormal structure into that normal form, and then fragmentation to create more infectious ends, very similar to the growth of amyloid, amyloid fibrils. Um, and the different strains are thought to be encoded by different templated structures in um, such a method. Now, to get to the nitty gritty of the debate, the question is, is this process, does it involve ag aggregation? Well, I mean, it leads to aggregation in, in many, many circumstances, but not always gross aggregation detected by light microscopy, but it is a, um, a method of misfolding proteins um, that becomes a chain reaction. It's a, it's a self-perpetuating molecular process that has a side product of aggregation. Now, I think a target, as I'm going to go on to conclude, is related to stopping the prion process. Now, in itself, that's not targeting the structures that are identifiable, identifiable under light microscopy. Now, people can interpret themselves which side of the debate I'm on in making such a statement. But what I wanted to do briefly next is to cover some evidence because my detractors might say, well, prion mechanism, well, that's a very rare disorder. You, you know, this is nothing to do with other neurodegenerative disorders. Well, that, that position is becoming a little difficult to sustain based on, also based on long-term research. This started with Colton Gadisek's lab um, trying to inoculate animals with other neurodegenerative diseases, subsequently pursued by Ross Ridley and Harry Baker, but really driven forward to a huge extent in the noughties by Matthias Jucker, Larry Walker and others, injecting material, either synthetic or from uh, ex vivo, into transgenic animals and showing that you can massively bring forward the onset of pathology or, or start pathology when it wouldn't ever appear, even with peripheral injections. And this has been taken forward into many other different protein offices by Virginia Lee and John Trojanowski's work in more recent years, certainly to cover tau offices and alpha synuclein offices as well. What about human? Our main contribution to this was the discovery that people that have been exposed to prions um, and, and from cad cadaveric material uh, containing prions had a very, very high frequency of amyloid beta deposits in the brain, largely a cerebral amyloid angiopathy, but also parenchymal A beta. And in some of these circumstances, it leads to, to disease through brain hemorrhage uh, and stroke. So quite dramatic amyloid beta pathology here shown in the parenchyma, here a cerebral amyloid angiopathy, which we propose was caused in young individuals that would not be expected to have this kind of pathology because they were injected with cadaveric material that contained prions and also contained A beta seeds that behave in a very similar way to prions. This, there was a workshop led by the Dementia Research Institute in London director Bart de Strupa recently with about 30 or so experts in the field that did not contest this hypothesis 
about how amyloid beta pathology has been spread. We all agree also that there is no evidence at the moment that Alzheimer's disease is transmissible in this way, but the groups that have been exposed to cadaveric material have not been exhaustively studied. But the mechanism, the mechanism of transfer of A-beta pathology um, is, is definitively a finding that's been replicated by groups around the world. I haven't got time to cover all the evidence for the transmissibility of other proteins involved in other neurodegenerative diseases, kind of a summarized it in the table here. But prion-like behavior can be summarized in terms of transmission to cell models, to animal models, serial passage, and then human-to-human -human transmission or zoonotics. Um, and there's a wealth of evidence for a range of different proteins that they exhibit some prion-like behavior. So just in my last two or three minutes, I do want to directly address the debate title, which is what is the target? Okay, and, and I, have to, I have to acknowledge that I don't think highly aggregated deposits of PRP in the brain of CJD patients, I don't think that is the right therapeutic target, no. However, PRP is the right target. Okay, so I just want to spend a minute summarizing the latest thinking about how prions evolve and how, how to explain transmission between animals and humans with prion diseases, and that's the conformational selection model. So here we hypothesize that a primary sequence of PLP can adopt a range of different three-dimensional structures that then propagate by templating. And when you try and transmit a disease between patients or you have different primary uh, structures of PLP with different alleles of, of prion protein in a patient, how that disease propagates depends on whether or not those different primary structures can adopt the same conformational states. And the point is that what we think is going on in an animal or a patient that are propagating prions is there's a cloud of different abnormal three-dimensional structures that are replicating. And the point and the relevance for this for therapeutics is if you design a drug, for example, an antibody, that was to bind to one of these specific structures. Uh, let's say you, you design something to bind to this majority species here, the, the blue pentagon in, in this hypothesized species one. What you would find is you may eliminate it completely, but prions would propagate with other structures to which your interventional compound does not bind and therefore would evolve away from the therapeutic. Now, has this happened in real life? Yes, it's, it has happened. The paper I cite here, Leotel Science 2010, Charles Wiseman showed in Cell Culture that, that prions will evolve to escape um, drug treatments that try and cure the cells of infection. Okay, And it's also been demonstrated with uh, a therapeutic that went into human as a clinical trial in CJD, quinacrine, where Stanley Prusner has quite nicely shown um, that um, uh, prions will uh, evade. Um, therapeutics like quinacrine uh, that bind PRPSC by adopting alternative conformational states in a Darwinian way. So what is the target? Well, the active treatments that are being pursued in CJD at the moment include monoclonal antibodies um, and antisensolical nucleotides. Monoclonal antibodies bind PRP and prevent it from taking the abnormal structure. So take out the normal form. So exactly the opposite of what Alberto is saying. You can cure mice a prion infection if you treat them early with monoclonal antibodies. And recently, an alternative method is not just monoclonal antibodies. Eric Minikel and Sonia Vallab, working with Ionis, have shown that antisense oligonucleotides that bind the PRMP transcript reduce PRP to dramatic treatment for mouse prion disease, extending survival of mice from about 200 days to 400 days. So exactly the opposite. You have to knock down the native state and eventually prevent the prion process and therefore prevent aggregation. So to conclude, uh, prions are lethal human pathogens um, that are comprised of multimeric assemblies of misfolded PLP. They show strain biology and these um, proteinaceous infectious agents show Darwinian evolution through their three-dimensional structures that make them extremely hard to target. Most of the active strategies that actually target the real disease, not just a transgenic model in mouse and can and dramatically treat it, involve, treat, and involve therapeutics that target the normal form for binding or reduction in its concentration. So whether or not you think I'm a strong proponent or, or not of this debate really depends on what the term aggregation really means. 
But if, if it, you mean toxic misfolded proteins, then in, in a sense I'm saying your therapeutic strategy has to eliminate those, yes, but not by targeting them, by reducing the fuel that makes them. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Mead, for this excellent talk. Um, we move on to next speaker. And um, next speaker is uh, Dr. Karian Esat, who got his uh, PhD in 2012 in neurochemistry um, at the Stockholm University in Sweden. And after that, he um, did a postdoc in, uh, in the UK at Oxford and worked on gene therapy for neuromuscular diseases. Um, he came back to Sweden and um, is at the Karolinska Institute since 2015 and is working on the biophysical mechanism of amyloid aggregation in neurodegeneration. Please, Karim, go, go ahead. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, do you see my screen and hear my voice? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I'm obviously uh, the youngest and least accomplished of the stellar um, uh, people that have spoken before me. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak here. Um, uh, we have, I have a collaboration with Alberto, and that's probably why we are on the same side, although we are on the opposite sides of the Atlantic, but we're still on the same side scientifically. So um, this is the title of my presentation, Proteins Precipitate and They Don't Replicate. And of course, there has been a lot of introduction. I will not go uh, too much into an uh, introduction, but just amyloid pathologies are very widespread. Uh, so amyloids are fibrillar protein aggregates that are uh, involved in many diseases such as Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, Huntington and prion pathologies. And this is how they look like uh, in, under the electron microscope. And that's probably why, um, yeah, uh, Alberto, for example, focused on Parkinson's and Alzheimer uh, and Dr. Mead uh, focused on prion, but they are all based on, on this amyloid um, uh, transformation. So let's start by these are the uh, the tenets of the current paradigm in, in amyloid pathology is like it's a protein only uh, self-replication as professor Mead uh, alluded to gain of function toxicity that uh, there is a protein species that can self-replicate and can kill the neurons by, by gain of toxic function so we, we re-examine it at like in three um, three parts is it is it truly protein only can we call this process self-replication? And is it, again, of toxic function uh, mechanism uh, of, patho uh, of pathogenesis? So first, let's examine, is it, are amyloid pathologies protein-only pathologies? And for this, let's start by this experimental setup where we have um, two tubes with high concentration of oligo one in the blue with the high concentration of oligonucleotide and the other with the high concentration of am an amyloidogenic peptide. Let's say it's amyloid beta 1 to 42. And if we add nanoparticles or viruses to these two tubes, what will happen is that the oligonucleotide will remain the same at high concentration. However, the amyloidogenic peptide will start forming um, an amyloid, we a process called heterogeneous nucleation, where the virus or nan nanoparticle act as a catalytic surface for the conversion of the amyloid peptide from the soluble phase into the insoluble amyloid state. So, uh, this uh, and in this system, there is actually nothing that can be uh, called uh, or labeled as replication because the viruses do not do not replicate in this system because they need cells. Oligonucleotides do not replicate in this system because they need enzymes. And evidently, amyloid peptide didn't replicate because actually we end up with less concentration of the amylogenic peptide and um, more uh, amyloid that was catalyzed by the surface of the virus. And certainly, there was no information or structure or, or conformational uh, information transmitted from the viral or the nanoparticle surface to the amyloid. Uh, and this process can be replicated in the same experiment by seeds of the amyloid that is um, added to the to the mix it, they would also cause amyloid aggregation by seeded nucleation or if we just add more peptide to increase the concentration to a level that then the, the amyloid will start to spontaneously form and these are the three pathways of amyloid formation heterogeneous nucleation which is catalyzed by a surface or seeded nucleation which is catalyzed by seeds or primes or just 
um, destabilizing the system by making it uh, so unstable, then it starts to precipitate by itself. So uh, I believe the right description of this process is it's not replication, it's just phase transition. So proteins transforming from one phase being soluble to another. And phase transition is a very wide uh, phenomenon. It happens like when water, for example, transfer into ice, like this beautiful uh, snowflake, it's just a transferring of molecules from one state to the other. So as water has different phases like gas, liquid, and solid, proteins also can exist in different phases, such as these nice soluble uh, fluorescent proteins that can, when they co condense and coalesce the, the liquid-liquid phase separation, they can form these droplets, which now is a very uh, well-studied uh, field uh, of, of this liquid-liquid phase separation. But if they change the phase one more time, then they will start to form a solid in the form of amyloid fibrils. And uh, for the phase transformation or phase transition to take place, uh, it's not, uh, it's, it's a biphasic process where you have initially a, a long nucleation phase uh, where the system is metastable, but, and then once this nucleation phase is passed, then you get a spontaneous, uh, sorry, you get a, um, a growth phase. Uh, however, if you have a catalyst uh, like uh, a prime or a seed, uh, or a surface that can catalyze the process, uh, the nucleation phase, then you get directly to the uh, elongation uh, or the formation of fibrils. And an example is here for the formation of crystals, for example, when you have a high concentration of sodium acetate, you add this spherical surface, and this spherical surface kickstarts the phase transformation from the soluble to the insoluble, and the same reaction can be mediated by a crystalline seed. So this is basically what happens in the amyloid. It can either be catalyzed by a seed or by a surface or by just simply increasing the concentration. So uh, one of the most neglected pathways for amyloid formation is the heterogeneous nucleation, which is not catalyzed by a protein at all. So it is catalyzed uh, by a surface and it's a very well studied phenomena in the, um, in the science of, of phase transition. Uh, and it's actually the most likely pathway of, mo uh, of, uh, of phase transition for, mo for crystallization and many other phenomena. Um, and actually, um, uh, Sarah Linse uh, in, in uh, Lund University that uh, Dr. Yanni has mentioned earlier, uh, they have shown in 2007 that nanoparticles can actually act as catalytic surfaces, uh, which induce the uh, transformation of, of uh, proteins into the amyloid state. So they catalyze the process of amyloid formation. So last year, we just published uh, similar findings, but not using uh, nanoparticles, but using viruses. So in this study, we, we considered viruses as nanoparticles because they are nano-sized obligate intracellular parasites, and they are biophysically equivalent to nanoparticles. So when we mixed viruses, with amyloid beta uh, 40 and amyloid beta 1 to 42 peptide, we've obtained similar results that the viruses can act as catalytic surfaces that induce amyloid formation of amyloid beta 1 to 42 via heterogeneous nucleation. Um, and we've shown that the viruses can directly interact with amyloid fibrils. Uh, and even in vivo, when we injected the virus in the brain of an Alzheimer's disease animal model, 48 hours post-infection, we see dramatic increase in the accumulation um, of amyloid plaques in the brains of these mice. Also, heterogeneous nucleation is not a phenomenon that happens only in pathological conditions because, for example, I'll just have this again, that heterogeneous nucleation is utilized by actin, for example, to form the actin filaments. So it is a physicochemical mechanism that the, the cell uses to form a functional um, uh, polymers and functional fibrils like actin uh, by, by having this uh, heterogeneous nucleation catalyst protein, which is called spire. However, there, there are uh, important differences between a physiological nucleation and a pathological nucleation, uh, which in case of the physiological nucleation is very controlled, very specific nucleators, um, and it's, the proteins are assembled in their native conformation. However, in the pathological nucleation, it's uncontrolled, it's driven either by uh, a foreign seed or a foreign surface, or the, and the proteins assemble not in their native conformation like actin, but in the cross-beta conformation, which is um, 
the generic conformation of amyloids. And I mean, this is a process of self-assembly that is driven by, um, uh, by heterogeneous nucleation, uh, but we, we never describe this as a process of replication. It's just a process of phase transformation uh, and self-assembly. So, and this will bring us to the second um, uh, like uh, part of, of the current paradigm is, can we say that the protein self-replicates uh, just by the protein being precipitating or self-assembling based on a very common mechanism of phase transition? In my opinion, I think this is not the right description because first of all, surfaces can induce uh, amyloid aggregation and this is not self, these are non-self, these are not proteins at all. And when the surfaces catalyze the protein transformation, at the phase transformation of proteins, there are no structural or conformation information transferred between the surface of the virus or the nanoparticle to, to the growing fiber. Importantly also, the, regarding the fidelity of, um, or the faithfulness of, of the transfer of, of any type of information, the process of this uh, self-assembly is dependent on the conditions like concentration, pH, and temperature as factors that are not encoded and in my opinion, cannot be encoded by the cross beta structure of the amyloid and hence cannot be faithfully replicated. Um, so also to make this more clear, if we compare the actual molecules that replicate like DNA comparing to the cross beta conformation of amyloid, I mean, there is no machinery, no code, um, it cannot unwind, it's insoluble, uh, and it's nucleation dependent and it's, um, uh, also dependent on, on surfaces. So there is nothing in the cross beta structural uh, that can uh, faithfully uh, replicate uh, structural or biological information in any way similar to the double helix, which is has a very defined um, sequence, very defined mechanisms, very dedicated machinery, very complicated machinery to ensure the replication uh, of biological information. So I think it, uh, describing uh, proteins as, as uh, self-replicating is, is as absurd as saying that this uh, crystal of ice when dropped in this super cold water kind of replicates into more ice. In my opinion, um, I think the more accurate description is that the super cold water uh, is at a metastable state. And once it's kick-started into phase transformation into ice by the catalytic uh, crystal. So this is a very simple uh, and uh, accurately described uh, phenomenon of phase transformation, which doesn't involve any uh, replication. And again, there are different pathways. It can be via surfaces, uh, heterogeneous nucleation. It can be by seeds or can be simply by increasing uh, the concentration. And these are the uh, different pathways that we recently published in review where we uh, use this as to expand the etiology uh, of, of uh, amyloid pathologies, which have been very restricted within the protein only paradigm that it has to be a kind of only a protein using this, excluding many other factors, but expanding this to the other possible pathways of protein aggregation, like uh, surface catalyzed uh, aggregation, we can now be a very well defined mechanism, include viruses and bacteria and fungi as triggers of amyloid aggregation. And this is, can be very well described by physical chemical mechanisms. Also lipid pathology and nanoparticle pollutants, all this can act as, um, as, as catalyst for, for transformation. Uh, and the last part is about, so if, if protein aggregation can be mediated by all these factors, what is the consequence? Is it a, is it a gain of function that does amyloids necessarily become more toxic? Or is it a, initially at least a loss of function? So when a protein aggregates, there are two types of consequences. A certain consequence is that the protein, when it aggregates, it loses its function because anything, any protein will require its native conformation and solubility to become functional. However, if it, it loses its function, become aggregated, the initial thing has to be that it loses its function. Whether it, or not it becomes more toxic is, is, is not as certain as, as the loss of function. And seeing that the amyloid phenomena affects so many uh, proteins, uh, approximately 40 proteins uh, in so many diseases, including P53 in cancer, amyline in diabetes, and insulin, even endorphins in the brain can form amyloids. It seems that very widespread phenomena uh, and affecting many, many proteins, many of them have very, very well-known functions. 
For example, insulin in the insulin-derived amyloidosis, when uh, patients inject insulin under the skin um, several times, the increased concentration of the skin locally generates uh, insulin amyloids, and then these patients cannot have poor glycemic control because they are not benefiting from the insulin being injected. So the solution for these patients is not to target their insulin or not to target their amyloids because they are very benign. The solution for these patients is to ask them to inject insulin in a different place so that they can replace the loss function of the insulin that has aggregated under the skin. Uh, so this is a clear example of a loss of function toxicity due to amyloidosis. Another one is the P53 amyloid. The P53 is a tumor suppressor and it can form amyloids. However, when P53 forms amyloids, it actually causes enhanced cell proliferation, not causes cell death, which is contrary to what we expect from an amyloid to, uh, to be formed. So uh, this can only be explained by P53 amyloids having um, a loss of function uh, problem. Uh, also, there are other paradoxes within the gain of toxic function. Uh, is that uh, many uh, people have um, amyloid burdens in their brain, but they are cognitively normal. And many of the drugs that have been devised to target these uh, amyloids have not led, uh, haven't led to, to clinical benefit. And as I will not go through this because Alberto already mentioned it, but we found that at similar amyloid load, the diff what differentiate between the uh, one minute, Sorry, I, I'm almost done. Uh, what differentiate between uh, the cognitively normal and the AD is actually the levels of the soluble uh, protein. Uh, and this, sorry, and also uh, in, even in autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease, the patient with autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease have lower levels of A beta 42 compared to uh, non-carriers, even in Down syndrome, when you have the duplication of the APP gene, um, the Down syndrome patients have lower level of A beta 42 compared to, to the control. So in, in, in all the sporadic and uh, uh, genetic forms of the disease, uh, the common thing is the lower levels, not the higher levels. Um, and animals, knockout animals and knockdown animals uh, have been shown to have phenotype uh, affecting synaptic uh, activity and regulation of neural hyper excitability. So, without amyloid proteins at all, we can still see phenotype. So, go, uh, gain of toxic versus loss of toxic function, both are compatible with the genetic evidence uh, because we are not saying that amyloid beta peptide or alpha synuclein doesn't have anything to do with the disease, but it does have, but not with this mechanism, with the mechanism that they lose their function. And the, the mechanism is very well established because proteins need to be soluble to be functional. And there is no need to for other entities that are very difficult to identify like oligomers. And actually the data, the clinical data correlates much better with the lower levels of, of the proteins rather than the higher levels of the aggregates. So for, for therapeutics, uh, we have tried everything in the gain of toxic function basket, but we've never tried the loss of function uh, hypothesis for therapeutics. And usually uh, the new um, idea in treatment of, of neurogenitive disease is like we have to get early uh, biomarkers to be able to target these proteins early, like we do with cholesterol, with statins, but we target cholesterol when it's higher in, in, in people who have the disease, not in, when it's lower, like in the case of Alzheimer uh, and in other amyloid pathologies, these proteins are low. So are we going to target them to be even lower? So I think we have a, 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 an insulin, not a statin thing, that uh, in 1921, Banting and Kulip, they, they managed to uh, find insulin in, uh, uh, by experiments on dogs. And even before knowing what exactly insulin is or what it does, they managed to save millions of lives. So uh, this is the final conclusion that since many surfaces can induce uh, amyloid aggregation, heterogeneous nucleation is, in, is incompatible by the protein-only self-propagation, and proteins don't replicate, they probably just precipitate, and loss of function might be the way forward. So it's just looking at the same problem, the same genes in a different way. So sometimes it, it takes just a different perspective to, for things to make sense. As Thomas Paine once said, 
we have it in our power to begin the world over again. We might just need to look a little bit differently. And thank you. Yes, thank you, Karim, for this talk. And now we move on for the, to the rebuttal part of this webinar. And first in the line is uh, Professor Janne Johansson. Um, so please go, go ahead, uh, uh, Professor Johansson, with your rebuttal. So, well, sorry, so I'll be brief. So, uh, yes, commenting on the proposal that uh, the loss of the soluble A beta would be um, uh, toxic. That is, I think, um, not supported, rather, the contrary, by uh, known mutations associated with familial Alzheimer's disease. So, the mutations that uh, increase the production are actually giving rise to disease, while mutations that decrease the production. Uh, are actually prevented. So uh, according to the suggestion that the soluble form would be toxic, it would be the other way around. But I'll uh, just um, a very short also comment on the fact that all amyloids are not uh, equal. So you, it's more dependent on what pathway you use for forming the amyloid. So I hope you see the, the screen. So um, this is the A-beta kinetic traces. And depending on whether you affect the so-called primary nucleation where monomers come together or the elongation where A-beta monomers add to the ends of existing fibrils or the secondary nucleation that I talked about where monomers come together on the catalytic surface, you get dramatically different effects on the amounts of uh, oligomers form. So while targeting the primary nucleation just delays the formation of the oligomers, but you get exactly the same number of oligomers. If you instead target the elongation, you get an increased amount of oligomers. So this is, would be something to induce uh, amyloid disease if you block the uh, elongation specifically. While if you block the secondary nucleation um, specifically, you reduce the number of oligomers quite uh, substantially. And um, looking at the next slide, uh, which is also, I think uh, it was not brought up here, as far as I un understood, but uh, one strong um, argument being used is that um, if the amyloid hypothesis is correct, why do all clinical trials aiming to, to target the amyloid hypothesis fail? And um, this slide, I think, which is from a recent publication by Sarah Linse again, shows that different monoclonal antibodies that have been used in uh, failed clinical trials, uh, these four ones, they do not target the secondary nucleation specifically, but they target other pathways. Yannick, yeah, could you please put a full screen on your slides? Okay, uh, I'll try. Thank you. Is better? Yes. Yeah, thank you, sorry. Um, so um, th this is the primary nucleation, the elongation and the secondary nucleation, which is the uh, proper, pathway to target if you believe the, the kinetic uh, uh, analysis. And this one is then targeted by the BRICOS domain. It, it is to some extent targeted by uh, aducanumab, but the other antibodies uh, target completely different pathways, which then would actually be predicted to be rather um, causing uh, pathology rather than uh, it's, uh, preventing it. And this is also the affinity for the fibrils, which if you block the secondary nucleation, you need something which has a high affinity for the fibrils, which the BRICOS has, uh, the aducanumab, while the other uh, antibodies, um, with some uh, exceptions, do not target the fibrils at all. So my suggestion would be that the failed clinical trials is not that, that we have uh, targeted the wrong uh, target, but it's that uh, they have the incorrect or not the mechanism of action that will uh, prevent the formation of toxic oligomers. And if you, on top of that, note the fact that uh, antibodies um, in principle do not pass the blood-brain barrier at all, uh, it is not so unexpected, I would say, uh, from the knowledge today that these clinical trials actually have failed. So these were my, my short comments and thanks. For Thank you. Thank you very much for sticking to the time. And now, um, let's move on and next in turn for the rebuttal is Professor Alberto Spai. Um, 
Thank you, Martin. Uh, I think the issues with our discussion relate to causation, and I've seen a lot of questions on the question and answer uh, section related to causes. So when uh, somebody dies of Parkinson's disease, and I get a confirmation as a clinician that that was Parkinson's because the autopsy material showed that there are aggregates, uh, we call them Lewy pathology. What stops me from me saying, I found the cause of the problem. In fact, that's how our field has been defined. Uh, this is a century old idea that uh, what we found in the ashes of the fire must have caused the fire. We cannot conceive that what's in the ashes of the fire could have possibly been the last time in soldiers. We cannot conceive that idea. We must be what we see, what's caused the problem to begin with. And it certainly is interesting that what we don't see may well be the cause of the problem. But what we don't see by the time an autopsy comes along is this soluble fraction that gets into the aggregates because that's invisible, that's lost. We've lost it to the aggregated forms. That remains invisible, not only in the evidence on pathology, but in our minds. Now, the studies on Alzheimer's have been very successful. And I wanted to show you how successful they've been. This is uh, essentially the 35 trials in all fields of medicine, when you have a hypothesis, you, you, uh, you confirmed your hypothesis with a, with a positive trial, but you reject the hypothesis with a negative one. We neurologists do not do that. We do not reject hypotheses on the basis of negative trials. But look how successful these studies were. Nearly 70% of them accomplished exactly what the drugs were meant to do, to reduce amyloid. So it's a great success that we can reduce the amyloid in the brain the manner that the drugs were designed to do. It just so happened that true null studies were 59, but in fact, in nearly 40% of them, the treated arm reduced the amyloid, and yet they get worse cognitively, and when, when measured, atrophy measures were worse as well. Now we say, this is because we're targeting patients too late. But in fact, there have been prodromal trials, uh, that's MCI essentially, people who do not meet criteria for dementia, and in half of them, there has been a shortening of the time to dementia and an increase in the hippocampal atrophy. So we have the answers here. We just don't want to accept that negative trials or worse can possibly imply that our ideas are wrong. These must be artifacts of the trials. There must be problems with the patient selection, must be problems with the dosage, must be problems with the measurements. But God forbid, it's a problem with hypotheses. We're neurologists. Okay. Um, thank you. And now um, we move on to the next speaker to provide his rebuttal. And he's Professor um, Simon uh, Smith. Thanks. Thanks, Martin. I don't have any slides, but I'll just respond to individual points. You know, just Alberto, coming on to the last point you make about amyloid, I think, you know, Alzheimer's disease is clearly a tough nut to crack. There's no doubt about that. But a negative trial doesn't necessarily lead you to a specific answer either. And I think what I would say is Alzheimer's disease has two misfolding proteins. And there's a huge amount of energy gone into dealing with a beta. Um, but you've still got um, misfolded, aggregated, propagating, I would say, tau there. And that's a perfectly alternative, perfectly good alternative explanation of why things have failed that doesn't ally with your hypothesis. I think um, we do, we can learn about causal mechanisms in human through genetics. I mean, it's not, a, it's not a randomized controlled trial, the best way, but it's, a, but genetic mechanisms are implicitly causal because we're born with these changes. And I've got to say to Alberto, Kareem, both of you, the genetics doesn't look like a loss of function mechanism, right? We know what loss of function looks like. They, you know, they're metabolic disorders of childhood with recessive mutations. They're like progranular mutations where you've got an allelic series of stop codon mutations, frame shifts. What do we see um, in Alzheimer's in Parkinson's disease? In PD, you see triplication of 
alpha-synuclein. You see common variants that increase expression of alpha-synuclein. You see Down syndrome where you have more copies of APP. You know, all of the genetic mechanisms are pointing to increased amounts of the monomer that push you down the aggregation pathway. You don't see loss of function mutations. You come to my area, right? Come to my area. Knockout mutations of the prion protein gene give you complete and total protection against the disorder and no disease. These are fertile animals. They get a late, very, very late onset neuropathy, no new neurodegeneration. There's a series of different transgenic models that half express, third express, three quarters, two fold, three fold, four fold, eight fold. There's a beautiful relationship between susceptibility and incubation time to prion disease. The more PRP you've got, it's bad. Okay, that is not genetically, in terms of causal mechanisms, is not in keeping with what you're proposing. I think, Kareem, you know, your talk, I loved all your videos and um, metaphors, and but, I mean, which are great, right? But I think the problems that you have with the terms replication are simply, you know, trivial semantics, right? The term replication comes because prions are an infectious agent and people believed it was a virus before it was discovered it wasn't. You know, that's where all the terminology was formed. There's no need to rail against that. People agree with the comments that you're making about how um, phase transitions can be precipitated. That isn't really an argument against the established position, I don't think, right? Um, uh, you know, if you're proposing something more, that prions, there's really a hidden virus that we haven't discovered yet in prion disease. I say to you, look at Claudio Soto's work. How do you go from femtograms or atograms of starting material and amplify up billions of fold without any viruses being there, right? How do you, how do you, amplify an infectious agent like that if, it, if, if the really survive. I don't think you were saying that. I think it would be ludicrous for you to say that. But um, if you were, that's what I would recommend you read. I think, Alberto, coming back to your, your first talk, what I would say to you about the anomalies of late onset sporadic disease and uh, epidemiological studies is I think a lot of these anomalies come from the fact that there's only one point in time you look at the autopsy material. You know, it's it's cross-sectional and, you know, we don't, you know, people may, have, you know, their relatives said they were fine when they died aged 100 and they had bad pathology. But, you know, we don't know what then what would have happened next year and the year after. We know there are very long incubation times in these disorders. It's well established that the pathology can appear in healthy individuals a long time before clinical features start. So I don't think studying pathology and trying to correlate that is is sensible. And in any case, I don't propose that these highly aggregated light microscopic detected forms are the toxic agents. I don't think many people really think they are, apart from the peripheral amyloidoses. Um, those are my comments. Maybe I didn't take up enough time. But I enjoyed the debate. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. You're exact on time. Thank you, uh, Professor Mead. And now, um, Karians, turn to make a rebuttal. Uh, please go ahead. Uh, I'm just um, trying to find my presentation. So first, uh, I will talk about uh, the genetic evidence because this is usually uh, the go-to point. Um, and again, in, uh, sorry, this is what the genetics say. So in autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease, uh, the carriers have less EBITA42 compared to the non-carriers. Um, and this, this, this is a New England Journal of Medicine study of Bateman, very famous, very well cited. And this is a science translation medicine paper showing that people with, with worse uh, score uh, on the cognition score have less uh, a beta 42 so so the genetics in here actually points to a decreased a beta 42 not an increased uh, a beta 42 the same also with down syndrome uh, that's why i titled it when more is less because in down syndrome you have a duplication in app but the patients end up having less a beta 42 both in cross-sectional analysis and both in longitude and also in longitudinal analysis, they have a beta 42. So if the aggregation, if, if the amyloid is not the toxic um, form, then it's not a soluble thing either. It's not a soluble ligament because it's actually going down uh, in, in the disease, not going up. So, and this is why I have this representations to try to show that it, 
not all, all overexpression means a gain of toxic function because if you overexpress to a certain level, then this will lead to spontaneous formations of nuclei, and this nuclei will lead to amyloid formation, which will ultimately result in less peptide. So you get a genetic gain of, fu of function, which means more peptide, but you get a biophysical loss of function because this peptide is too concentrated and starts to precipitate out of solution uh, and out of function. So I think uh, as I compare here that both the gain of toxic function and the loss of toxic function are compatible with the genetic evidence because in alpha cyanuclein, you see the same trend. In the PRPC, we see the same trend. I've just read uh, a recent review by uh, Professor Mead, who also cites some of the papers, which show that the PRPC goes down in uh, the soluble one, the so uh, CSF PRPC goes down in many of these diseases. And actually, these proteins are very well. Uh, uh, expressed in the nervous system. So, I mean, why, we, they have to have uh, some, uh, I mean, why would they be highly expressed in the nervous system if they, their only function is, is to aggregate and become toxic and then the levels go down? Um, I think the loss of toxic function uh, ex can explain the toxicity without the need of new ad hoc, uh, really um, uh, very vague, uh, species like the oligomers, which are usually used in in vitro studies at very at supraphysiological concentrations to show toxicity. I think if we can uh, imagine that insulin can lose its function in, in insulin-derived amyloidosis, or p53 can lose its function in um, in, um, in amyloids in, in cancer, it's it, it's not a very wild shot to also. Uh, imagine that the AB-42 or alpha synuclein or PRPC, which are proteins that are uh, evolutionally conserved and produced to ha with high levels uh, in the neurons, also have function that uh, is lost. And back to the animal models quickly, I, I chose one because this is, was a nice recent review that uh, for AB-42 knockouts uh, or, the S uh, or, or by antibodies against AB-42 or using SRNA. So these are at least 20 different studies using different methods of knocking down AB-42. And they all show a phenotype related to memory and neuronal function and synaptic uh, activity. So I think evidence from the clinical data uh, and from the animal studies and from the genetics and from the biophysical data can all uh, like make a very nice case for the loss of function and the failure of the clinical trials i think need to promote us to think in a different way um, of dealing with these diseases because i mean going back early in the disease would not do anything because these the soluble fractions that professor Mead said that they are the uh, uh, like the um, fuel for the fire the fuel is actually less in the diseased people than in normal people. So, I mean, I don't know how we can target something that is less in the patients compared to the normal people. And the only way I can think of a treatment for this discrepancy is actually to restore the function of, of this to, of, of, to the level of normal people rather than taking down even further. Yes. Um, thank you, Karim. I think um, we just have two minutes left for this webinar. And some of the participants have been very eager to ask questions and have been replied. So let's see if we can have, um, well, we can take one last question here for um, APP knockout. Uh, it's not the same as AV 42 knockout, important. I mean, I think this is a comment for, well, I think you, Karen, or, or, um, or um, Jana. Yes, Janne, you want? Yeah, this is the comment from, from Per Nilsson. So um, yes, that, that, I think that is the whole um, reason for making the APP knock in mice that uh, APP is not only giving rise to the A-beta peptide, it gives rise to a number of other processing intermediates and, and the protein itself certainly has a function, although it remains to be exactly identified as far as I, I understand. So yeah, I, I, I would definitely agree. Uh, thank you for this uh, clarification. Um, well, I think um, Can I this quickly. Yes, please. Uh, I just uh, will share um, uh, my screen just very quickly. 
So yeah, the problem with the knockouts, of course, uh, yeah, uh, is uh, that the phenotypes sometimes get mixed, but that's why it's, uh, in many studies now, uh, people have used the RNAi technology to knock down the proteins in adult animals. Uh, and they have seen, for example, here in the RNA mediated of alpha-synuclein leads to nigrostellate degeneration in mice, in rats, and in primates, and these are knocked down. So this is targeting the adult uh, levels of the protein and only the protein. And people have shown similar results with targeting A beta 42 by sRNA by antibodies. They also can show a neuronal phenotype. So I think we there is already a, a wealth of literature, a wealth of data in the literature pointing out that knocking down uh, these proteins in adult mice can have devastating. Um, effects, and I, I really don't uh, understand uh, why the opposition for uh, something that a very um, like common sense in biology that proteins have function, and when they aggregate, they lose their function, and probably people need to uh, restore the function of the proteins that are lost, especially that we lack a mechanism for understanding the toxicity of amyloids or oligomers, and we lack uh, the success clinically that we remove this and it doesn't work. So I don't think the loss of function contradicts with the genetics or with the data from the animal models. I don't think it contradicts with the data from the clinical uh, studies, which shows that these proteins are, are less in, in diseased people. Okay, I think um, it's time to, to wrap up. Um, I thank all the faculty members for the great talks and for a well, great discussion, um, and also to the participants who, well, um, ask questions and, and, uh, and join us. I think this debate will continue. I, I mean, um, there, there is more to, more to discuss. Like, um, I mean, we didn't have a space or time to, to discuss what happens in polyglutaminopathies, for, for in, like Huntington's disease and other polyglut disorders in terms of protein aggregation. There is also a lot of, debate on what um, is the role of protein aggregation. Or, but uh, that will be for the, for the next webinar. And um, yes, um, thank you again and, and, um, and have a nice weekend, uh, all of you, okay? Thank you. Thanks for organizing it, Martin. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Bye.